Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 52 of the Cloud Computing Training Show with Brad Nelson and internationally recognised and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Limpicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. In this week's show we are talking about the cloud services are projected to become a $300 billion business by 2021 and according to a report by the job search site Indeed, positions related to cloud computing have increased with some job titles rising by 108%. Hi Dave, it's great to have you on another training show this week. Yeah, it's great to be here and this is a big problem that I think enterprises aren't figuring out yet and we'll, we'll see if we can uh, put, our, put our minds around it. Yes, yeah, certainly, and and it, and it really is a, a big deal with regards to uh, you know the lack of talent, which we've covered uh, in, in a number of different shows, and, and how we go around finding that lack of talent for people to fulfil their needs and their their cloud objectives. So, look, opening question for the show then is how will this affect someone's career? Do you think? Well, it depends on uh, what skills they have. If they're um, looking for skills and they're a uh, you know cloud. Or a CIO, and they're looking to deploy, you know, use utilization of a hundred different cloud services and do migration in the cloud over the next few years. Then this is going to be a um, uh, limit, limiting career thing because they're not going to be able to move as fast as everybody expects because they can't find the talent to make the move. So if you're someone who's in IT but don't necessarily know cloud skills, you're probably sitting on the sidelines wondering how to jump into the parade and. You know, make sure you get your piece of the pie, and so you get the higher salaries and the higher respect in the industry, things like that. And if you're someone who is a cloud architect, a security ex expert, uh, you know, cloud engineer, you know, that rose, you know, 108 uh, percent, you're sitting happy and really kind of kind of pick and choose where you want to work. And so I see a lot of probably usury going on with employers where. You know, people are working at home, you know, 20 hours a week and getting, you know, a, a month's vacation and uh, $200,000 signing bonuses. It's, I think those sorts of things are going to start popping up. So it could be good, could be bad, depending on who you are. And I think it's uh, just something we have to consider in terms of the market. It's going to be like this for the next year, year and a half. Yeah, it's it's a funny market because, as you say, you know, there's there's people out there that do have the pick of the jobs, and there's also people that want to come to the market that find uh, it a challenge to get into the market. So they don't have that historic cloud experience. You know, they've got that education through AWS or Azure through one way or another, and they're trying to get their foot in the door. And it can be frustrating sometimes to get those the grads, I suppose, ex grads into particular roles that where the you know they don't have the historical experience from a cultural fit point of view. Yeah, what's your what's your advice for that sort of thing, Dave? I think that uh, I, I think that we have to um, you know consider what we want to be when we grow up. You know, so at the end of the day, and so if we're you know looking at um, our organization in terms of hiring the best talent, um, in terms of training the best talent, in terms of running the best organization we can, it's going to be very different than a traditional organization that was even run as you know as a uh, few as you know, 15 years ago, you know, 20 years ago. So the stodgy organization where we have uh, roles and responsibilities and silos and office politics and, uh, you know, people who have certain times they have to be to work and certain times they have to leave, th that's quickly coming to an end. And I think the reality is we're finding that people are more productive if given the opportunity to be creative and kind of working around people's skills and their, their wants and their desires. And of course, that doesn't mean you can be a loafer. You have to get things done and you have to manage by objective. But as far as putting people under rigid control, um, you know, making them show up at nine o'clock on Monday with a tie on, I think those days are completely gone. And so I think the organizations, even the organizations that are typically not technically focused are gonna have to adopt a culture like that. And the reality is that to keep the people that they need to really kind of drive the organization, and it's going to be, you know, leveraging digital technology as a as a um, as a force multiplier to get into the particular business, or else you're going to end up being disrupted. I mean, I wrote a a blog last week on uh, Deloitte.com on um, on the brand apocalypse, and I think that we're going to see a lot of companies that just kind of fall by the wayside because they're unable to adopt this culture of innovation. They're unable to leverage technology as a force multiplier. And when you get to the essence of it, you'll find out that lots of people just kind of refuse to change. And so the companies that are able to change and basically adapt to the newer markets and adapt to the realities of certainly the labor market and get the training in place and get the culture in place, 
to make them successful are going to end up winning and surviving, you know, over the next five to 10 years. Companies that just push back on that and think it's so much nonsense are just going to fall by the wayside. Yeah, it's so true. People really need to evolve their mindsets and uh, their business cultures to, to fit the needs of what's going to be, you know, moving forward 100%. I mean, you know, I'm looking at this as well from a point of view of, you know, people that are, you know, dipping their toe in the water with regards to trying to get into a cultural fit with work. You know, are you looking at an infrastructure point of view, a platform point of view, or are you looking in as a more of a, a software point of view? Because, you know, there's there's three sort of sub sub genres as there were to cloud that, that people can really define a career path in. And I think that's really key as well, isn't it? To making sure that people aren't just, you know, being generic, they're being more specific with, you know, where's their direction, where's the foundation of their career gonna lie, and then be more specific within that. Would 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 you agree with that? What would you like to bring to that? Yeah, I would with certain limitations because if you're going to be an infrastructure person or you're going to be a software development person or you're going to be a network engineer person and are a security specialist, you have to understand those particular niches uh, in great detail because they're going to ask you that you understand those things in great detail. But you have to also have to understand how DevOps works, how security testing works, um, you know, how uh, business works, you know, how things function. And I think the days of us you know, kind of sitting in particular silos and doing nothing else are, are kind of long over. People have to have a, an eclectic array of skills and be able to understand what's going on. And if you look at DevOps, for example, you know, people who exist in the pods, they're going to have business skills, they're going to have development skills, they're going to have all sorts of uh, very eclectic array of skills that are going to make them better developers or security architects, things like that. Developers who understand the business or uh, worth their weight in gold because they're typically going to reflect the business needs and the software that they're building. So it's okay to have these skills, and I think you're absolutely right that you're going to have to figure out something you're going to specialize in. You can't do everything just like doctors. They're going to focus on orthopedics and brain surgery and things like that. We have to focus on infrastructure and network and security, but you have to have an eclectic understanding of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, because we spoke about this, I think it was last week or the week before, I can't remember. We definitely spoke about the fact that you've got to get more general, and I think that's really important, that you're, you you know, being specific to a brand, like we said, like an AWS architect or something, it's all very well and good, but you've got to be more general on your cloud expertise, and then niche down, or at least run them parallel to each other. Like you say, you, you can bring more to the table. As a career, you, you bring more value as an individual, don't you? Yeah, and you're also being more helpful to the company um, in, in terms of uh, being able to step up and get problems solved that you may not be uh, you know, tasked to solve. It used to drive me nuts when people work for me, and they would claim that, that it's not their job. They, you know, That's a network problem. That's not my issue. Um, well, the reality is you work with the network team, understand what the issue is, and assist them in you know, solving the issue. And it turned out in that instance and other instances that it was a software problem that was causing the issue, not a network problem. And so... You can't really, you know, start building a fort around your cubicle in these offices anymore. Well, that used to be the case years ago. People used to, you know, just, you know, just defend their territory. And that they wouldn't let anybody in or wouldn't let any skills out. And they really kind of focus on what they're looking to do. I mean, these days, that's the recipe for um, uh, failure um, because we're not going to get the people who are creative and changing and all consideration of everything that are going to kind of take the business to the next level. So you got to have general skills. You got to have specific skills. You got to know what you're doing. You got to have general skills and understanding about architecture, security, things that are not necessarily under your purview. But if you build a software system, you're a developer that ends up being hacked because you don't understand rudimentary security and how that's built to the application level. That's on you. I mean, that's not on your lack of security training and you know, you claiming that's somebody else's responsibility. That's your piece of software. You made the mistake. You caused the issue. Yeah, so true. And I think you're right. Gone are the days where people can say, well, that's not my job. Because <laughs> people inevitably go, well, it, it, it's not your job. Well, then you've got a limited time span because we want people that will take that responsibility and have that as part of their job. So it's, uh, it's one of those things where people can't really rule themselves out as not having that job anymore or it's not being their job because uh, they're sort of devaluing their, their worth to the business, aren't they, really, to a certain degree? Yeah, and you also you need the autodidacts, the people who are really early to learn on the fly. So, I mean, we had you know roughly um, you know fifty to seventy-five new services show up at Amazon at AWS reInvent, you know, a couple of weeks back. Well, you need to learn what they are, what they do, and how they work within your problem domain, how they work outside your problem domain, how they kind of change your your view of architecture and change your arsenal of weapons you're able to bring to bear. 
And if you're unable to do this dynamic learning, this continuous learning, uh, it's going to be very difficult for you to keep up with this industry. Certainly will be. Uh, so look, it moves us on nicely to your top three tips, although we've probably covered a few now, but um, yeah, it'd be great to hear those, Dave. Yeah, is a demand, you know, to, you know, demand to skills kind of, a, you know, kind of the market now. So in other words, what we're doing is we're reacting to demand, you know, uh, with our skills being augmented. Uh, so we're learning very quickly as, as technologists that if we learn security, we learn cloud infrastructure, cloud architecture, we'll be able to get the big jobs. And the cool thing about that, there's also certification programs that don't take a whole lot of time to get through. And they're they're probably not that difficult if you're if you're fairly technical and understand the basis of computers. And I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. I, I'm not sure that I want to hire somebody who's just reacting to skill changes because it may be AWS this week, it may be you know uh, AI and cloud security you know next year, and they want to change their skills into moving in that direction, and then the tide shifts again, and they change their skills again. And they have being a jack of all trades, but worthless to every company that wants to hire them. So keep that in mind. Make sure um, what's hot is what you like to do. Uh, I run into a lot of people that uh, do cloud and don't necessarily have a passion for cloud. They want to do analytics. They want to do, uh, uh, and not on the cloud, they want to do um, uh, supercomputing systems, things like that, things that are not based on, on cloud computing specifically. You can certainly find them as aspects of cloud computing, but um, they're finding they get paid more to be an AWS admin than they do being a supercomputer specialist. And if that's not your passion, you're going to get frustrated with that very quickly. And so make sure that if you want to move in the cloud, make sure you're moving into a role and responsibility that's going to make you get up in the morning and go uh, and go work in a happy way. Make sure you open uh, yourself. Make sure you're open to other geos. Um, one of the things I think people do, they like to work locally. And so they'll just look in the want ads or Craigslist or something like that to get the local the local jobs because they think, that they're going to have to commute, things like that. Reality is uh, a lot of companies are hiring remote workers where you'll never have to get on a plane. You may have to go out there for um, an orientation and maybe a few meetings every year, but you can work at home in a very happy way and work for a good company, and you should be open-minded to those organizations. Unless you're you know, one of those people who likes office politics and going in every day, you know, good luck doing that. Yeah, I, you know, but that's, you know, these... Uh, you know, keep your options open. This remote work stuff is great. Yeah, great top tips there, Dave. You also mentioned something which I, I, I think is true as well. Some people do like to be in an office because they need that water cooler kind of office politics environment. It's, 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 it's For some people, I think it's a comfort zone thing. It's like a, a comfort blanket where they've got that. Uh, but there are other people that, uh, admittedly, that are moving forward into more of a remote working sort of thing where they are, you know, uh, able to work on a, a, an isolation basis. But, you know, I have spoken to people that, that do feel that the water cooler is cooling um, and that they need some sort of office environment. So absolutely bizarre. I, I've never been one for the water cooler politics, to be honest with you. But, um, yeah, it, it definitely happens, doesn't it? It does. It does, and uh, if you want you want that kind of environment, go work someplace else. I don't want to work. I don't want to work with you. We got we got work to do with clients and people who need things these problems solved. If people are concerned about office politics, then uh, get a time machine, go back thirty years. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Start using your fax machine and all that sort of stuff. We don't we don't want that shit. Anyway, look, I've digressed. I've digressed. Dave, thank you so much for your top three tips, and thanks for being part of the uh, training show this week. It's been awesome. Always a pleasure. Excellent, and thanks for watching everyone. We really hope you enjoyed watching the show. Uh, you can get David on Twitter, which is at David Lincoln. I'm on Twitter at Nelson underscore Hilliard. Check out Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all the other social media platforms, iTunes and Stitcher. Become part of what we're doing uh, with them as well, because that's cool. You can listen to us on your um, iPods, iPhones, whatever it is, Androids, anything you want. Uh, and also check out the blogs David writes for us as well. We've just published, I think, about six blogs, which has been pretty cool over the last week or so. Um, so check those out as well. There's a link below in the description box. And thanks for watching. And remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share this channel with your friends and with your colleagues. And click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of the future shows that are coming up. Again, thanks for watching. And until next week.